Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. And this is going to be on mucinocystic neoplasms of the pancreas, what you need to know. During the uh, pandemic, I've been giving conferences every Wednesday to the faculty and fellows and residents, and I've tried to stress the ability to not simply detect a pancreatic lesion, but to be very specific as to what the lesion is. And so you're going to see over the next few months a series of lectures on various pancreatic lesions, trying to give you great familiarity as to how the lesions look. So in this talk, I'm going to speak a little bit about cystic lesions, focusing on mucinocystic neoplasms, or MCN, as they're typically known, and how they look and how you can make a very specific diagnosis. So the key then is, can you accurately diagnose an MCN on CT? And what indeed can you say about it? So several facts. MCNs are most common in middle-aged females. They're typically located in the body of the pancreas, sometimes closer to the tail, but rarely near the head. They're usually larger than 4CM or with nodules when they are malignant. So the thing about MCNs, they're going to be removed surgically because they're essentially considered to be pre-malignant. And the WHO nomenclature uses the term MCN in conjunction with the histologic grade, low-grade, intermediate-grade dysplasia, or high-grade dysplasia. It's a relatively uncommon tumor, but again, we are seeing more of them. Often, they're incidentally seen on imaging about 20% of the time, though other cases present with abdominal pain, recurrent pancreatitis, gastric outlet obstruction, or even a palpable mass Sometimes they get large enough, and I'll show you some examples. If you want to evaluate them further, EUS can work out very nicely. Uh, the cytology, mucin-containing cells with a high CEA. The CEA, however, has no correlation with malignancy. So in terms of numbers, presentation, abdominal pain, 62%. But again, these incidental findings are probably in the 20% range. There was a recent article talking about the pearls and pitfalls of uh, pancreatic cystic lesions, a case-based approach, and I kind of liked it. They divided uh, the cysts into three categories, primary neoplastic cysts, which they called serous adenomas, MCNs, IPMNs, and SPENs, non-neoplastic cysts, which were pseudocysts or congenital cysts or lymphoepithelial cysts as some examples, and then various solid neoplasms undergoing cystic change, including cystic neuroendocrine tumors, which we're most familiar with, as well as occasionally adenocarcinoma or acinar cell tumors. So again, these primary neoplastic cysts is where they put MCN. They mentioned that unilocular cysts are thin-walled simple cysts without solid components or septations. A simple unilocular cyst can be a pseudocyst, but also IPMN and MCNs also fit into this category. Occasionally, cirrhosis adenomas, the oligocystic variant, though in most cases, cirrhosis adenomas have septations or central calcifications. And every once in a while, you talk about these neuroendocrine tumors, but quite frankly, with neuroendocrine tumors, you are going to get um, uh, enhancement in the wall. So, I think it's going to be uh, not that difficult to diagnose as there. The article also mentions that mural nodules or solid enhancing components are typical features and high risk markers in mucinous tumors. Whenever we see in an IPMN or an MCN a solid component in the wall or thick inceptations with enhancement, then you have to worry it's malignant and that lesion is going to be coming out. Now, there's a distinction between mural nodules and mucus plugs, which is something you see more on EUS. But when we see any mural nodules, that really basically means that the patient is going to have this resected. Now, one can also uh, discuss when do you need EUS. If you think a lesion looks malignant, it probably doesn't matter what the EUS is going to show. You're simply going to resect it. Sometimes EUS is done. There is a consideration at times of complications like pancreatitis, which can delay surgery. There is a thought sometimes of spreading tumor. If you really know what the lesion is and you know it's going to be resected, EUS may be just simply superfluous. 
On CT, non-complicated serous and mucinocystic neoplasms are typically water density. On MR, they're homogeneous hypointensity on T1 and hyperintensity on T2 images. Um, the density and intensity of the contents cannot discriminate mucinous tumors having malignant potential from benign lesions. So one of the things we are going to look at in the near term with radiomics is can radiomics distinguish malignant from benign by looking at its signature. That's kind of interesting. In this article, also in looking at different tumors, when you're trying to compare mucinocystic neoplasms, one of the things you always think about is IPMN. You also potentially think about cirrhosis adenomas, though those are more common in the tail. Sometimes it's easy because not so much that you recognize the MCN finding, but you recognize a different tumor finding. So stellate calcifications, fibrocentral scar, you think about cirrhosis adenoma. Peripheral eggshell calcification can be seen with MCN, and it's highly predictive of malignancy, and I'll show you a case later. And calcifications are common in spend tumors, but they're often peripheral in punctate, and with spend tumors, there is a difference in age groups. Remember, spends are teenagers and 20s, not people in their 40s and 50s. Both SPEN and MCN are more common in women. Calcifications are reported in about 20% of IPMNs. Punctate calcification is going to be the most common. Uh, that has no impact on the potential for malignancy. It's typically at the edge of the lesion. A thing with IPMNs compared to MCNs, uh, IPMNs are commonly associated with duct dilatation. You can have mixed type IPMNs where there's tumor in the duct or high grade dysplasia as well as cystic lesions. Calcifications can be seen in about 16% of neuroendocrine tumors, but they tend to be more focal, more coarse, and more irregular. But again, I think typically when I see a neuroendocrine tumor, the wall is thicker, also, it's the enhancement that makes life very easy for me. Now, there was an article recently also discriminating between serous cyst adenomas from MCNs and IPMNs in the pancreas. And their conclusion was pancreatic cystic neoplasms that show central scarring, central calcification, or circumvascular sign on CT uh, can be diagnosed as serous cyst adenomas when either of the first two features is combined with the circumvascular sign, the diagnostic sensitivity could be increased. And the circumvascular sign is really uh, nicely defined here. It's the presence of abnormal arteries surrounding the lesion. And that's something that you typically see with serous adenomas. It almost makes them look like they have wall enhancement. You don't see that uh, with MCNs. You don't see really any abnormal vessels. Every once in a while, vessels can be displaced but when they're large enough, but typically things are simply pushed. Wayne goes on to say the central scarring, calcification, and circumvascular sign have high specificity, so that becomes very important. Again, combining the circumvascular sign with other findings increases the sensitivity of detection of a cirrhosis adenoma. So again, not helping you diagnosing MCN, except for the fact it's helping you move on to a different diagnosis. So that becomes very important. And again, it's something we are looking at. It's a good sign. Linda Chu actually described that sign a number of years ago without giving it a name, but spoke about how you have this draping of vessels with cirrhosis adenoma. It's not a neovascularity type appearance. It's simply more of a draping. So let's go back to mucinous cystic neoplasm specifically. It's usually in the body or tail of the pancreas. There's no communication with the pancreatic duct, but if they get large enough, they can't obstruct the pancreatic duct. So again, that helps separate it from an IPMN. Cis and MCN are usually over two centimeters, and there's less than six cysts present and it contains an ovarian type stroma, which is why some of the cystic lesions with septations look very much like ovarian malignancies. So some of the key features, typically a smooth external contour, relatively thick enhancing wall, as you can see in this case, peripheral calcifications, and thick septations and nodularity are suggestive of malignancy. If you look at this case, for example, things you might think about potentially a spend tumor if the patient is younger, though we see spends in older patients, a serous cystadenoma, 
or a uh, IPMN, it would be a very large IPN, PN, PMN with uh, potential malignancy. So let's look at some classic lesions. Here's a cystic lesion, distal body tail of pancreas, well-defined water density, measuring about six centimeters in size. The remaining pancreatic gland enhances normally. There's no evidence of dilated duct. I do not see any calcifications. It looks like there's some asymmetric thickening in the wall of the lesion. You do need to be careful to make sure you're not confusing partial averaging with pancreas for wall thickening, but you can see it nicely here. And again, it's a good diagnosis. What else could I think about here? I could think about a cirrhosis adenoma. I could think about an IPMN. In theory, I could think about a pseudocyst. One thing that makes a pseudocyst less likely is the atrophy of the distal pancreatic gland. Another example, here you see a cystic lesion, that same location, classic, body tail region, but you see thin septations. And here's just a few more examples of that same case. You see thin septations, the septations are enhancing. You typically will not see the septations on non contrast scans, though occasionally you might. And it definitely shows a bit better on venous face imaging, and this is consistent in the appearance with an MCN. When the lesion has septations, even without septations, this lesion surely would be resected. There's suggestion of wall enhancement, but the septations put you in the category with this lesion's gonna be resected. Here's some more images. I do find doing reconstructions, at a minimum, the coronal views, but also 3D volume rendering works very nicely, as you can see in this example. And even cinematic rendering is really good. Remember, cinematic is really good for texture displays. And I think in that situation, being able to look at the texture, the image on your left makes it very simple. We're dealing with an MCN, and this lesion has a high chance of at least a moderate to high-grade dysplasia. The thought that this could be a cancer, I think that's hard to say yes or it's hard to say no, but regardless, this lesion will be coming out. Again, nicely shown with the vascular map on the cinematic rendering. And again, one of the things we will do is create the vascular maps. Uh, this patient will end up with a distal pancreatectomy. They'll save the head of the pancreas. One of the things also you wanna be able to do in these patients is potentially do this laparoscopically. And the cinematic rendering with the 3D mapping can definitely help in that regard. Another case, well-defined lesion, body of pancreas, no dilated pancreatic duct. When you look at this, you almost wonder if it's a bit exophytic. Is it pushing against the pancreas? But when you start looking at the images like the coronal, you could see it's sitting right in the body of the pancreas. It's pushing on the stomach. This patient had some abdominal pain and some fullness after eating, but you can see a very, very classic lesion. And I am showing you a number of different images so you get a feel of how this lesion specifically looks. And you can see it very nicely. If you look hard in this case, you can see a septation. Another example, looks identical to the last case, but it's smaller. This is roughly three centimeters. Again, rest of the pancreatic gland enhances well. It's kind of a bit eccentric, which tends to be not uncommon, particularly when lesions are smaller, but there's no evidence of a dilated pancreatic duct. If this was an IPMN, there would be a dilated pancreatic duct, or you would see communication with the duct. Could this be a cirrhosis adenoma, oligocystic type? I guess it can, but it's not the greatest location. Could it be a pseudocyst? If the patient had a history of pancreatitis, that's at least theoretically possible. Here it is on the coronal view. Just a few nice examples showing you how the image indeed looks. Another example, almost the same as the case before, vague abdominal pain, cystic lesion, well-defined, water density, a thin septation when you look hard, no dilated pancreatic duct. Just a very nice example of a classic mucinocystic neoplasm. So you see, I'm giving you a lot of cases, coronal view where you really begin to understand how the lesion looks, and it looks very similar. Now, sometimes it's gonna be the case it doesn't look similar to these cases, or it's hard to be certain, but with this appearance, I simply describe a cystic lesion, I describe the characteristics of the fluid, the septations, the wall, location, and then I would say this looks like an MCN. And here it is on the cinematic rendering, very nicely shown there. 
and there as well. There's the few more images. Again, the fluid density. The cinematic rendering in this case shows you a septation. So that indeed can be very, very valuable. And here's another case. Small lesion sitting right in the body of the pancreas. Couple centimeters in size, well-defined, and water density without evidence of a dilated pancreatic duct. Just a very nice example. So again, in this case, I think it's a little bit trickier if you look at the image on your left. Perhaps you wonder, could this simply be a cystic um, neuroendocrine tumor? Because it looks like there's a little bit of wall enhancement. So I would at least think about that in this case. Sometimes it's just very difficult. And again, this idea about vague abdominal pain becomes very important. As I mentioned, 20% of the time they're incidental findings, but 80% of the time the patients will have symptoms. So let's do this. Let's stop at this point and let's come back in a few minutes and let's look at some more cases. And I'll see you then. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.